Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Speaker, my question this morning is for the Minister of Finance. And uh, we learned from CBC's Mike Crawley this morning that the Goreway gas plant in Brampton has overbilled ratepayers to the tune of $105 million. Okay. However, Goreway hasn't repaid every dollar that it gained ratepayers out of. The numbers are, are blacked out, so we don't know, Mr. Speaker. It's like deja vu all over again. Wow. Speaker, how much did Goreway pay back to the government? How much is government letting them keep after they spent years gaming the system? And how are they going to keep this from ever happening again? Minister of Finance, Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually want to thank the minister for raising this question this morning because I think it's an important question. And look, there is no excuse for any company in this province to ever game the system of anything that the government's doing. Uh, and the fact that this matter has been uh, what was found out about by the ISO means that the system in place is actually working because they found out about this some, some time ago. They fully investigated. They've recovered most of the cost. They delivered a $10 million fine, the, the biggest fine on record. They posted the report and the record fine on the OEB website for, so it's on the public record. The ministers and in, in the, in the OES, ISO has taken steps to ensure this cannot occur again. And in fact, with the market renewal process they've put in place, there's no Answer. way this will ever occur again. But I appreciate the minister raising the issue. It's a valid question. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, and, I, and I thank the, the member opposite the minister for the, uh, the response today. But, Speaker, the government has appointed uh, a market renewal panel, and you'll never guess who the chair of the market renewal Tell panel us. is. Tell us. Who is that? It's an executive at Goreway Power. Oh. Oh. Speaker, What's going on? the Goreway gas plant's costs were more than every other natural gas station in Ontario combined. Its price to start up was more than twice that of the second most expensive gas plant in the province. But the government never made them submit itemized expenses and only reviewed their costs when it was too late. Speaker, this isn't the Treasury Board president not getting receipts for pizza. This is hydro customers' bills we're talking about here in Ontario. The abuse continues. So when is the minister going to make sure Goreway repays the ratepayers of Ontario every last red cent that they are owed? Minister. Speaker, I am not here and will not in any way uh, defend the actions that Goreway uh, took. Uh, they, uh, they were caught. Uh, they've been, uh, they've, uh, most of the costs, costs have been recovered. Uh, a $10 million fine was imposed on them, as, uh, as should have been. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, this company has restructured its executive. Their CEO resigned as chair of the working group on December 1st. So he's no longer chair of that working group, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but uh, again, uh, there's no excuse for this, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to, to a company like this. Uh, we will not tolerate it. I'm pleased that the ISO was there and, and discovered this uh, right off the bat uh, and, and engaged in a very long uh, and, and, and comprehensive study uh, uh, to ensure that the costs were recovered Answer. and that a $10 million fine was, was levied. I think that shows the system was working, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, Your final supplementary. Speaker, the government was alerted about this in 2012, yet it continued well into 2015. We know that as a result of the report at the Ontario Energy Board. I know this is like the ghosts of scandals past over there, Mr. Speaker. Here we have yet another gas plant scandal in Peel Region that's costing electricity customers over $100 million. One Goreway executive, when describing how they were able to game the system, said, quote, put a bow on it. Christmas came early. This is what was going on at Goreway. The market surveillance panel warned the government back in 2009 that these programs were ripe for abuse, and the government did nothing. Nada. Zip. They didn't do anything about it. Speaker, if the minister won't make sure that the Goreway gas plant has to repay all of the money it took from ratepayers, will he at least apologize for the incompetence of a government that once again failed to look out for electricity customers here in Ontario? Here, here. Minister. 
from time to time, Mr. Speaker, whether you're a private sector organization or a, uh, a broader public sector organization or you're a government, Mr. Speaker, at any level, sometimes people try to game the system. The key is, is to, number one, ensure that those folks are brought to justice when that happens. In this case, uh, they've, they've been levied a $10 million fine, and most of the costs have been recovered. Uh, as, as well, Mr. Speaker, it's important that you look at your systems, and that's exactly what the government and the ISO did to improve the systems. They've done that to ensure that this type of gaming could not occur uh, in the future. Uh, also, Mr. Speaker, they've moved to completely uh, restructure the system, uh, to, which is this market uh, renewal system that's being put in place that will further address any potential for gaming to happen again. Mr. Speaker, yes, this is unfortunate circumstances. The key is the uh, government and the ISO responded appropriately. Thank you. New question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Minister of Health. I again want to ask the Minister uh, about the People's Guarantee Commitment to invest $1.9 billion in mental health. This is very important to me, despite the heckles from the Liber Liber Liberal government. That's because not only is this the largest investment in Canadian provincial history, it will also build one of the most comprehensive mental health strategies in our province. And to do that, we need an historic investment. I again ask, will the Liberals join us in making the commitment? Will they invest $1.9 billion in mental health? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the question. I want to start off by saying how proud I am and how far we have come as a province. All parties, in fact, in this legislature have pushed past the stigma, and we all agree that we need to do more. But it's important to take a moment to appreciate how all Ontarians will benefit from that. The Conservatives have come to the table offering an average of $191 million extra each year over each of the next 10 years for a total cumulative investment of $1.9 billion. But I think, Mr. Speaker, as a province, we can do better. We can aim higher than that, Mr. Speaker. We can work together to truly build the system, reduce wait times, and offer more services to those who are in need. And, Mr. Speaker, we can make it clear that in Ontario there is no health without mental health, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to be part of a government that has increased mental health yes, spending every single year. And I'm happy to talk more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. $1.9 billion will go a long way to improve mental health treatment. I didn't hear that you were going to make that commitment. Um, our plan talks about using some of this $1.9 billion for targeted investments into youth and children's mental health services across the province. I think we all agree that wait times as long as 18 months are unacceptable, and this funding would help reduce those wait times for mental health services. We would invest in funding for mental health support services at Ontario colleges and universities. So, Mr. Speaker, this is something I believe that we should and we could could all get behind. So, with that being said, will the government explain why they have refused so far to adopt our $1.9 million commitment to mental health? $1.9 billion commitment. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, here's why I'm happy to answer that question. I'm happy that the party opposite has come forward with a cumulative total of $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. But it's not historic. In fact, Mr. Speaker, it's anything but historic, their commitment. This team, this Liberal government, has put $10 billion additional new dollars into mental health, into the system, in the last 10 years. $10 billion new dollars, not $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. And, Mr. Speaker, that is historic. And that is the legacy we will be continuing. Today, I am standing and committing that a Liberal government will put forward more than $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. Final supplementary. I'm like someone who didn't end up in an emergency room a month ago to uh, to deal with mental health, but uh, you should be very clear. We are talking about 1.9 billion dollars in additional 
funding. That would be historic. You have not in, in, indicated to us we're going to keep the funding where it is, and this is what this historic investment is going to do. It's going to top up elementary and secondary supports to improve mental health and well-being for our students. We're going to invest in suicide prevention counselling. We're going to bring in services for Indigenous populations through a preventative mental health team who specifically deals with Indigenous and Northern communities, and we will increase budgets of Ontario's designated psychiatric facilities to increase capacity and reduce wait time. So I will ask you again, without you making a mockery of this issue, will you stop talking about the past and start talking about the Sir, Will the Liberal question. government finally Member from the PN Carlton will come to order. Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the member opposite's commitment to mental health. I applaud the PC party's commitment to mental health as well. For, like, as with every single member in this legislature, we are all deeply committed to this issue, but it's critically important for the public to understand that their commitment is anything but historic. Our, using the exact same methodology, our new funding for mental health over the last 10 years amounts to 10 billion new dollars invested. Their commitment for the next 10 years dramatically would reduce that, that it would flatten the curve of our increases to a mere $1.9 billion. We are not going to make that commitment. I'm not going to sign their document. As I said earlier, today I am standing and committing that a Liberal government will put forward Answer. more than $1.9 billion over the next 10 years, just like we put $10 billion more over the last decade. Thank you. Be seated, please. As I've done in the past, the rotations have shown me that we're in warnings, and we are. New question. The member from Tamiskamy, Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. This morning, we learned through media reports that a private natural gas plant in Brampton gained the Liberal government system for managing private electricity contracts. Over a three-year period, the company cost Ontario families and businesses nearly $100 million in what the Ontario Energy Board calls inappropriate expenses. That's $100 million that went on to the hydro bills of everyday families and what is the Liberal government doing to ensure that those families are paid back? Uh, to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, again, I appreciate the uh, member's question. It's tough sometimes when you're on the third party and the, the question's asked initially, and I think a response is given, then you have to ask it. But I, I think it's important for all, all, all of us to pay close attention to these kinds of issues. There's, look, there's, there's no defending a company that tries to game the system. It's totally inappropriate. I think what we need to do is make sure we have structures in place to ensure, number one, that we know what happened and why, and, and that the appropriate measures are taken to recover whatever losses have been had. The ISO has taken those measures, fully investigated the matter. They've recovered most of the costs, and in fact, they've delivered a $10 million record fine. So I think on the surface, that appears appropriate to me. As well, measures have been taken to ensure that this kind of gaming cannot happen again in the future. There's also a significant restructuring going on called market renewal that yes, will sir. further address the gaming issue. So I thank the member for the question. Supplementary. The Ontario Energy Board investigation notes that the majority of the $100 million this company received was through the Generation Cost Guarantee Program, a Liberal government program. According to the investigation, the private Brampton gas plant's manipulation of the program was obvious and should have been discovered much earlier. There should be serious consequences for stealing money from the people of this province, people who are already suffering under the weight of sky-high hydro bills. So I'll ask again. How will families be reimbursed for the $100 million that the Liberal government paid to this private gas plant in Brampton? Thank you. Minister. 
I agree with the member. There should be serious consequences to any person or any company who tries to game governments of any type or any organization for that matter. And in this case, uh, there was a $10 million fine levied, a record fine. Uh, in this case as well, in answer to his question, uh, the costs have been recovered, so taxpayers have been reimbursed for the majority of the costs, Mr. Speaker. The matter was fully in investigated by the IESO. It did take some time to investigate because I expect this is a fairly complex matter. Uh, the matter was posted on record, uh, and the fine was posted at, on the OEB website, which I think is appropriate. Uh, and uh, as I said, measures have been taken uh, to ensure this doesn't happen again. I think the member is quite right to be uh, concerned about this, as we are, as I know the minister is, uh, and uh, it's an inappropriate ac action that took place. I do think, uh, on the surface, what I see so far, the ISO has responded Thank appropriately. Thank you. All supplementary. This information came to light this morning only after the CBC went digging and found the report. There was no fancy press release, which was completed almost a year ago. This $100 million is a massive fraud, and the people of Ontario are the victims. Why did, the government, why did this Liberal government keep this information so quiet and not do a press release as it does with all other hydro announcements? Thank you. Thank you sir. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the amount recovered, as I said before, uh, is the vast majority of the, of the amount that was, was lost, and in fact, there's a $10 million fine on top of that. Uh, so uh, on the surface, it looks as though justice has been done, uh, and this company, and there's no defending what this company has done, uh, has, uh, has been, uh, uh, has, and the taxpayer has been reimbursed for the funds, which I think is is probably the most important thing, but also important, Mr. Speaker, is number one to ensure that this uh, that the company does pay a price, and they did. But number two, to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And I know that the ISO has taken measures to ensure this kind of gaming could not happen again. Uh, and I don't have the details of what those measures are. I know the minister would probably have that. But the, uh, there's also they're restructuring the system so this won't happen again in the new system. Thank you. New question. The member from Tim. To Ms. Camille Cochran. <laughs> Sorry, Vic. <laughs> Once again, my question to the acting premier. Private gas plants in Ontario are gaming the Liberal system for payments to the tune of $100 million while the Liberal government keeps the information quiet. And they are also standing by while the privatized Hydro One plans to install prepay hydrometers to get around the current ban on wintertime hydro disconnections. Since we know the Liberal government can direct Hydro One to do things that benefit their party, will the acting premier direct Hydro One to do something that will actually help the people of Ontario and stop the private company from using prepay hydro meters? Deputy premier. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think sometimes the NDP, when they get a hold of a word, they try to vilify a word. So the word of the day or the word of the week is prepaid hydrometers, as though somehow uh, prepaid bills are something that is somehow uh, bad for people. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, uh, the minister's made it very, very clear uh, that nobody will be uh, in any way told that they have to have a prepaid meter. It'll be a choice. There are folks, Mr. Speaker, that in, in light of budgeting would prefer to have their bills prepaid. It gives a choice to consumers to be able to do that. There's nothing untoward. There's nothing evil. There's nothing non-transparent about this. Wrap up, please. I don't know why the NDP would want to take away that choice from consumers, Mr. Speaker, to be Thank frank. Thank you. Supplementary. Be clear. Prepay meters will hurt vulnerable Ontarians. They take away the option of working out a payment schedule if families get behind on their bills and instead force them to feed the meter or go without heat during the winter. The Premier and her Liberal government seem quite willing to direct Hydro One's activities when the result is a benefit to the Liberal Party. Why won't they do the same when the benefit would be for struggling Ontario families? 
Thank you. Minister. It's just not true, Mr. Speaker, what the member is saying is just completely false. Uh, no residential customer will be without power during the win win winter months, regardless of the type of meter used. So, so that's just a bogus uh, argument, I, I guess, trying again to vilify a word called pre -me prepaid meters. Mr. Speaker, there's all kinds of circumstances where consumers will prepay their bills. Sometimes it's a budgeting issue. Yep. Sometimes consumers prefer to do that so that they don't fall behind if, they, if they're on a, a commission type of salary uh, to ensure that they have a little bit of room left. Some people even prepay their taxes uh, to governments, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that, uh, indeed, they, it, it just helps them with their budgeting. It's a choice for consumers. They have to opt in. Nobody will ever be forced to do this. It's not, not evil. Answer. There's nothing, nothing uh, that, that affects vulnerable people in any way about this. It just gives them another option, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Liberal government's defense of prepaid hydrometers is, uh, is mind-boggling. Their inability to detect a $100 million fraud is, is just <laughs> it's beyond belief. And the bottom line is that everyday families are paying for these failures of privatization in our hydro system. Why is this Liberal government spending its time defending the private electricity system that clearly is not working in the best interests of Ontario families? Thank you. It's a two-part question, Mr. Speaker. We wouldn't even be talking about this issue of, uh, of this Goreway uh, issue at all if the matter hadn't been detected, so I'm not sure what the member's talking about. He said that the, the matter hadn't been detected. If the matter hadn't have been detected, then the IESO wouldn't have launched an investigation, Mr. Speaker. If the matter hadn't have been detected, then the IESO would not have uh, recovered the majority of the, of the costs, Mr. Speaker. If the matter hadn't, hadn't have been detected, then the ISO wouldn't have uh, registered a $10 million record fine. Uh, so what the member is saying, Mr. Speaker, I, I actually find mind-boggling that, what that question is. Why would we be talking about this had it not have been detected, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. A new question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, if there's one certainty here at Queen's Park, Speaker, it's that this Liberal government has broken every single promise they've ever made on auto insurance. In 2013, in a bid to save their minority government, they made a grandiose promise to cut rates 15 per cent by 2015. But four years later, they're not even halfway there because there never was a plan to get there. As the Premier famously put it, it was a stretch goal. So here we are with an election in sight. The Liberals go straight to our party's people's guarantee. This is the ultimate form of flattery, Speaker. The Liberals complaining about our platform on one day copy our auto insurance plan the very next day. Question. Speaker, to the minister, why did it take our people's guarantee to get you to finally move on auto insurance? Wow, Mr. Speaker, it's as if they never even read the Marshall's report when they brought forward their claim on uh, their glossy magazine. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I would argue that member to tell this House how he intends to, on the one hand, lower rates in one postal code geography without impacting the rates in his own riding in North Bay, Mr. Speaker. That is their plan. Their plan is to increase rates everywhere else in the province. We have come out with a very comprehensive plan to reduce if that continues, I'll find the individuals and warn you all. Finish. So I asked the member, how do you intend to reduce rates? The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. I asked the member, how do you intend to reduce rates in one geography without impacting the other, when in fact what we've done is taken a comprehensive approach? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the minister. Let's remember that it's his party, Speaker, that makes promises and then breaks them. Exactly. Minister of Finance is warned. There we go. Speaker, auto insurance premiums are still 55 per cent higher than all other Canadian jurisdictions. Wow. Four years ago, 
This government promised a 15 per cent cut, but they're only at 6.6 per cent, not even halfway there. They have completely bungled this file. They've made Ontario families pay the price. This is the fourth time, Speaker, the fourth time they've announced an anti-fraud office. Their record on auto insurance is embarrassing. Just as it was in 2013, this latest announcement is purely politically motivated. It's Groundhog Day Question, all over again. Speaker, to the minister, why should anyone believe you'll really do anything on auto insurance? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, they're already backing away from their guarantee. They're already stating that, oh, well, we don't really know. We're using your results, Mr. Speaker, and he is. Everything he's doing is based on the work that we already are doing. Fisco has for some time been looking at some of those changes that are necessary, and again, it's as if he never even read the report that is enabling us to provide sustained structural transformational change in the industry to go after fraud and scam artists. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. You may finish. We announced today a seven-point plan to do those transformations that's going to provide sustainable reductions. To date, we have taken action. It has reduced rates up to 10 percent at one point in time, and in fact, we need to go lower, Mr. Speaker, yes, and that's why we announced what we did today to go after fraud and go after and providing for support for consumers and victims, not insurance Thank companies you. and not those that are gaming the system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2013, your government committed to lowering auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. Question two. Oh, sorry, I apologize. My question to the Acting Premier. Since 2013, your government committed to lowering auto insurance rates by 15 per cent, but you let the people of Ontario down. Your excuse was it was only a stretch goal. Your government then tried to bury your report, which showed that even through Ontario has one of the lowest levels of collisions we pay some of the highest rates. Today, we heard about a new auto insurance scheme, and it doesn't even target rate reduction. Is this another stretch goal by the Liberal government to pretend you're lowering auto insurance rates right before an election? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, when there was— Sorry, Deputy Sorry. Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When that member and that party had the opportunity to act on recommendations to lower those premiums, they voted against the very measures that we are introducing, Mr. Speaker. They stood by. In fact, they turned their backs on Ontarians that very day. Literally, they turned their backs on them by turning themselves around when it came time to vote. We need to stand up for Ontarians, and we need to go after the structural changes, the predatory practices, the fraud, the scammers, all those that are taking advantage of people in the system, and go after them. And that's exactly what we announced today. We are going to make transformational change, we're going to fight fraud, and we're going to ensure those rates go down sustained over time. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Again to the Acting Premier, your government record on auto insurance speaks for itself. Your government promised to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent, and you didn't. Your government ignored our calls to end discriminatory insurance rate that hit low-income people the hardest. You said you wouldn't put insurance companies' profits over residents, and you did. We've seen this play out before. Before an election, you make promises about auto insurance, and right after the election, you let people down. Why would people believe you this time? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's again, it's as though they didn't read David Marshall's report because he also states that a public auto insurance scheme would not work and would cost us even more money. That's what they're advocating for in the end. What we're doing here is providing a standard treatment plan that enables those individuals that are victims of collisions get the treatment immediately as they should. It's going about establishing independent, neutral examination centers that aren't going to be held accountable to an insurance company or a legal provider. And it's going to establish a serious fraud office to go after those cases. And I encourage all of you to make calls to that serious fraud office to ensure that we curb the activities. 
You know, it's not just those that are committing fraud that are accountable here. It's those that are accommodating those fraud cases and paying out those cases that have to be held accountable as well. We're going after that, Mr. Speaker. We're going after contingency fees, and we have an expert panel yes, to ensure it gets implemented by next spring. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, everyone should be able to go to work knowing that they will be safe in their workplace and confident that they can return home safe and sound every day. It's important for all of us to take workplace violence, including sexual violence and harassment, very seriously. We know that the Occupational Health and Safety Act already has requirements to help us do this, and the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan has strengthened those requirements. This plan has ensured that since September of last year, the Occupational Health and Safety Act includes a new definition of workplace sexual harassment, the addition of workplace harassment programs, and specific new employer duties to address workplace harassment. Speaker, these measures do send a very strong message that sexual violence and Question. harassment are not acceptable in the workplace, but I believe more can be done. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what else this government is doing to address sexual violence and harassment? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Centre for this very important question on a very important issue. Speaker, it's a priority for this government that people are safe in their homes, in their workplaces, and in their communities. That's why we brought forward the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan. Speaker, in addition to the measures that were previously mentioned, the plan also established a dedicated enforcement team that responds to complaints. The inspectors on this dedicated team, Speaker, they've conducted nearly 2,000 field visits so far, and they've issued over 3,000 orders. What we're doing at the MOL, Speaker, sending out a very clear message that sexual violence and sexual harassment in our workplaces will simply not be tolerated in the province of Ontario. In addition to these protections, we're also committed to providing support That's to right. those who are affected by domestic and sexual violence, Speaker. Ten days leave five of which are paid, Speaker, 15 weeks of job-protected leave at a time they need it the most. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his very strong leadership on this. The new leave for those affected by domestic and sexual violence is one that I was incredibly proud to support for families in my riding of Kitchener Centre and around the province. I believe that workers and their families need time and support when they're dealing with these tremendously difficult circumstances, and this leave affords them that time. As the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, Hassan Youssef, said, and I quote, we know that designated paid domestic violence leave means it is easier for survivors to keep their jobs and escape violence and abuse in a relationship, and sometimes that can mean the difference between life and death. Speaker, it is hard to comprehend how the Leader of the Opposition and his caucus could deny supporting this leave, in addition to all of the other measures in Bill 148 that will help Question. so many people. Speaker, could the minister please share with us what other changes were made in Bill 148 to afford families the job-protected leave that Thank they you. need? Mr. Thank you again, Speaker, to the member from Kitchener Centre. Very happy to stand in the House to speak about the support that we're providing to Ontario's families. Through Bill 148, Speaker, we expanded a number of job-protected leaves. All employees will now be entitled to 10 personal emergency leave days. Two of those are going to be paid. A new two-year child death leave was established. Child disappearance leave, Speaker, was doubled. Family medical leave, Speaker, was increased up to 27 weeks. Pregnancy leave speaker was doubled, and I have to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for his advocacy on this. Yes. Critical illness was expanded. Parental leave was increased to 18 months. Speaker, all these leaves come into effect starting January 1st of next year, with the exception of the last two, which actually came into effect last Sunday. Speaker, Good. speaker, this speaks volumes about the dedication Answer. of this government. Speaker, in voting against and standing opposed to these progressive conservative policies, the official opposition are doing Thank exactly you. what we expected of them. Wow. New question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. You know, Speaker, facts still matter. We, well, Not to the Liberals. Well, you know what? Trust and accountability needs to come back to this place. Yeah. Yesterday, this minister would not correct a misrepresentation of the truth. Instead, uh, the member will withdraw. Withdraw. 
be careful going forward. Instead, this minister made another incorrect statement. He said the PCs would cut funding to the Go Regional Express Rail. That is factually incorrect. I would ask him to turn to the Toronto Star and read the paragraph that says the PCs would also complete the expansion of, of Go Transit service known as Regional Express Rail. Mr. Speaker, another factually incorrect statement from the Question. which is shocking. Will the minister apologize for his incorrect statement because he is simply wrong? I hope he does. I hope he does. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Wow, Speaker, what a wonderful opportunity. I thank the member opposite for uh, that friendly question. Uh, there's no record to correct, Speaker. Uh, having read the uh, the uh, uh, People's Choice Scheme, uh, I, anyone who's reading it, especially if they refer to page 76, where there are $12 billion in cuts outlined. Anyone can read that, Mr. Speaker. We all know that it's there, and it raises a question, Mr. Speaker. Where are those cuts going to come from, Speaker? Will it be cuts to OHIP Plus? You know that wonderful program that is going to provide prescription medication to those up to their 25th uh, birthday. Is it going to be free post-secondary tuition, Mr. Speaker? It may be. Are they going to roll back the $15 minimum wage, Mr. Speaker? There will be $12 billion in cut. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. You know, Speaker, the Liberals' fact-checking record is dubious at best. Yes. There is a litany of errors that come out of this Liberal research team, yep. and it happens time and yep. time again. Yep. When presented with the real facts, the Liberals refuse to back down. Just look at Trevor Tombe's article in Maclean's. Yep. Let's keep in mind that this is the economist the Liberals cited in their short-sighted attack. It says, Premier Wynne is wrong when she claims the PC plan will cost families more than cap-and-trade and do less to cut emissions. Wrong. Factually incorrect. Yet the government refuses to retract the statement. Speaker, will the minister do it now? Will he retract and apologize? Facts still matter. Well, Speaker, I, I was going to pass the question about RER to the Minister of Transportation, but, you know, since uh, the question is around uh, cap and trade and climate change, I want to just touch on that myself in the, and, and, and really talk about uh, some of the unbelievable statements that are coming from the, the, the party opposite. You know, Patrick Brown claims that analysis showing his carbon tax scheme, which would make everything. Thank you for the for the assist. I know what I'm doing. Title. Thank you. Sorry, Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition claims that uh, he has an analysis showing his carbon tax scheme. Uh, it's going to make everything more expensive in Ontario. That's a fact. You know, that's a fact, Speaker. So we have the third party economic As I promised, the member from uh, Niagara West Glenbrook is warned. Finish. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition has no plan, no real plan, to reduce emissions. His, his slapping a carbon tax on everything is going to Answer. cost us and all of Ontarians more and do less. Thank you, Speaker. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. To the Acting Premier. It is unfortunate that I have to question this Liberal government for the second time in a month about the abhorrent conditions in unlicensed group homes in Ontario. Last week, we learned that a 70-year-old man named Essa died trying to escape a group home in 2016 where he had been illegally locked inside a mouse-infested basement. Wow. Unlicensed homes are often a last resort for persons with disabilities, seniors, and those with mental health concerns. People who have nowhere else to go. 
They are forced to live in homes that the OPP have discovered to be overcrowded, unsanitary, unsanitary and in deplorable condition. The province has had these results from the OPP for over a year. Mr. Speaker, how many people need to lose their lives in order for this Liberal government to take action on unlicensed Question. group Thank you. Uh, the Minister of Health. Sure of health, long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite, I appreciate the question. This is a critically important question as well, uh, that we all uh, expect uh, the providers uh, in uh, these types of uh, care homes to provide uh, the supports uh, and um, a level of care which uh, both reflects the nature of that uh, uh, that care home, Mr. Speaker, but is of the highest possible standard. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, also worked and relied on our municipal partners that have that responsibility for uh, asserting and promulgating certain bylaws and uh, providing those necessary guidelines and regulations and protections that are necessary. That being said, Mr. Speaker, and I know that there was uh, an incident uh, 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 not that long ago with regards to uh, care home. Uh, providing care in Scarborough uh, that uh, the ministry uh, was involved in, uh, but it is an issue that I've asked the ministry to look at, and as it is a cross-ministry issue, you. to make sure that we can address this effectively. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Community and Social Services, who should actually be in charge of the portfolio. On November 1st, I asked the Liberal government to take action on unlicensed group homes. In her response, the Premier said to me, we are working on all of those fronts and it is our obligation to do so. It seems the Premier doesn't truly understand this obligation. Fifteen days after I questioned the Premier, a woman fell out of bed and died in a group home in Toronto. An additional problem is we don't know how many vulnerable people are dying in these horrendous conditions. One man with dementia fell down the stairs at a home and was never seen again. The incident was never reported to the police. Wow. Speaker, there doesn't seem to be any minister in particular who is tackling this head on. Will the acting premier tell us exactly Question. what next steps this Liberal government is taking to ensure that our most vulnerable are not living and dying in deplorable Thank conditions? You. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. Minister? The Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to clarify for the member opposite, the member from Windsor West, the exact responsibilities of my ministry, it is in relation to those with developmental disabilities and adults in that particular age group between 18 and 64. I'm very happy to talk about the strengthening of our oversight, my ministry's oversight, in respect to these particular facilities. First of all, our ministry contracts with agencies out in the community, some 300. Fish. Contract with a number of agencies, in fact, some 360 across the province, who then contract with further agencies that supply group homes. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Homes are for those with de uh, developmental disabilities, and we have legislated quality assurance measures that include a criminal and vulnerable sector screening, checks for all employees. Answer. We train all staff on abuse prevention and reporting requirements, and there are policies and procedures regarding the personal safety and security for all the individuals supported by the agency. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Transportation. I think it goes without saying that the way we move around to get to work or school, pick up our kids, and do errands has a significant impact on our environment. In 2015 alone, the transportation sector contributed to 37 per cent of greenhouse gas emissions. It's very clear from that statistic that something needs to be done. Speaker, I know that our government is taking a number of steps to get that percentage down. 
One important way we're, doing to, we're working on to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is by investing in active, sustainable forms of transportation like cycling and walking. Speaker, yesterday morning I was very pleased to have Minister Del Duca join me in Davenport to make an announcement about our latest investment to support cycling here in our province. Question. Would the minister please provide the members of this House with more information on that exciting announcement? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I'd like to begin, of course, by thanking the member from Davenport, not only for hosting us yesterday in her community, but for the incredible advocacy the, that she does for the people of Davenport on a regular basis. And, Speaker, as well, it I would be remiss if I didn't also take the opportunity to thank the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport for her unwavering advocacy on behalf of Ontario's cycling community. Uh, speaker, members of this House may remember that a number of weeks ago our government announced $42.5 million for something called the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program. Since that time, since that announcement, Speaker, a lot has changed. Thanks to revenues that were generated through cap-and-trade auctions, we were able to more than double the amount of funding available to our municipal partners for this fiscal year. Speaker, through this program, we announced yesterday that we'll be providing $93 million to support commuter cycling projects in 120 communities right across the province of Ontario. Speaker, yes, and here in Toronto, this city alone will be receiving more than $25 million to support cycling infrastructure for the people of this community. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It truly was a very exciting morning yesterday at Sweet Pete's Bike Shop in Davenport. Peach. I know that Toronto's share of this funding will go a long way towards creating a safe and dependable cycling network in my community, and I can't wait to see more people choosing to bike because of it. Speaker, for the past few days, we've been talking quite a bit about our government's climate change action plan. That is because just a short time ago, the Ontario Conservatives released their People's Guarantee. Speaker, in that guarantee, they made it absolutely clear that they were making no guarantee for our environment. Instead of investing in programs to make Ontario a healthier, more sustainable province, Policy, the leader of the official opposition wants to cut the critical investments we're making through our climate change action plan. Six billion. Speaker, through you to the minister, would the minister please provide more information Question. on how our government's plan to address greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation hey, sector hey, differs you. from the plan of the minister. party opposite? Well, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Davenport for her follow-up question, and I want to be absolutely clear. Clear. Our investment of $93 million for cycling infrastructure in every corner of the province, including, I would say, Speaker, in the leader of the official opposition's own community, would in fact be on the chopping block if the party opposite were to come to power and follow through on what they're proposing. And on this side of the House, Speaker, we know that cutting or eliminating the Climate Change Action Plan would also mean eliminating investments for electric vehicle charging infrastructure and also cutting or reducing drastically support for important transit and transportation projects like Go Regional Express Rail Speaker. But beyond the $6 billion that would be cut from these programs, Ontario's Conservatives would still need to find another $6 billion worth of cuts were they to follow through on their program. Speaker, Answer. on this side of the Policy. House, we will continue to invest in the things that matter most to the people that we are proud to represent. We'll move the province forward, we'll strengthen our Thank economy, you. and we'll make sure that people have the quality of life that they should be guaranteed. No, uh, Thanks, question. The member from Kitchener, Thomas Dover. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, a week ago, the People's Guarantee showed commuters in Ontario's largest, most vibrant yet gridlocked city what it would look like if a provincial government had their back in meeting their transit needs. Speaker, commuters in Toronto are sick and tired of costly, long commutes stretching further into more time away from family. They're sick and tired of delays and inaction on key pieces of infrastructure like the Scarborough subway as the self-proclaimed subway champion Liberals deliver a little more than repeated promises. Speaker, the People's Guarantee proposes to take the, on the City of Toronto's $1 billion funding portion for the Scarborough Stop the clock, please. Minister of Education is warned. Finish, please. Again, the People's Guarantee proposes to take on the City of Toronto's $1 billion funding portion for the Scarborough subway extension, as well as the cost escalator that the Liberals refuse to fund so that we can get that extension built immediately. Question. We've made it clear where we stand. Will the minister tell us which side of the tracks he stands on to finally build the Scarborough subway? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, you know, Speaker, I find this question fascinating from the member from Kitchener, Conestoga, in keeping with the fascination that I had when the member from Leeds Grenville asked my colleague just a few minutes ago to apologize for some of the statements that he's made over the last couple of days. Speaker, I got to tell you, as a lifelong resident of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, a proud lifelong resident who has literally watched us deal with the consequences for tragic decisions that were made by the Conservatives when they were last in power on transit and on transportation specifically, Speaker, I have to say, I want to know when they will apologize for killing and filling the Eglinton subway, Speaker. I, Speaker, I want to know when Patrick Brown and the Conservatives will apologize for first tolling and then selling the 407 to a Spanish consortium, Speaker. I want to know, Speaker, I want to know when that party will apologize for having a multitude of positions on the Scarborough subway, specifically that member from Scarborough, Thank Trevor you. Speaker, when our member from Scarborough on this side has repeatedly stood up for their community. Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Reminder to the minister, when I stand, you sit. Supplementary. Subway, the Wynn Liberals have played political football with the transit needs of Scarborough, kicking their hopes, of course, down the track. Commuters right across Toronto are at their end of the line when it comes to the government's failure to deliver. It's time for change that works for transit users, not only for those in Scarborough, but through a commitment to an additional $5 billion to build new subways right across the entire GTA. It's time for the Wynn government to stop making excuses and get shovels in the ground to get subways built. The Relief Line, the Young Extension and the Shepherd Subway Extension should have all moved ahead as prime candidates for development, but of course they have not, Speaker. While we prepare to move these vital projects forward, will the minister explain why his government has failed to provide this transit support that commuters in our GTA deserve? Thank you. Uh, speaker, as I was saying a second ago, I am determined to try and find out when that member and his party will apologize, will apologize for voting against every single Liberal budget over the last number of years that has seen fit to invest in more GO trains for Kitchener-Waterloo. Speaker, I want to know when they're going to apologize for, during the last campaign, flip-flopping repeatedly on the Ottawa LRT speaker, that our government is investing in. Speaker, I want to know when that party fundamentally fundamentally will have the courage of its convictions and stand up and just readily admit to the people of Ontario exactly what will you cut to make your numbers add up? How will you justify page 76? Will it be hospitals? Will it be schools? Will it be subways again, Speaker? Transportation projects in every corner of this province. Just have the courage. Patrick Brown, have the courage to tell the people of Ontario where you really stand. Another reminder to the minister and to all members that we are respectful in this place and use their titles or their writings only. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Remy Ranger is a 10-year-old boy with severe autism and other complex needs. This causes him to be very violent with himself and others. Due to a seizure he had at school, he ended up in a hospital where he spent the next 24 days. During that time, he had no treatment because the hospital said it was related to his autism. He was discharged last Friday, and his mother was told she was on her own while she had to wait for a placement at CPRI in London, which will not come for at least another five months. This family is in crisis and desperately needs help. Is this the service that the minister has promised families. Thank you. Minister Children Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite for, uh, for this question. As the member knows, uh, when it comes to, uh, to autism services and to uh, better positioning families uh, for success, um, uh, we've been doing everything we can on this side to, uh, to put forward a new plan for Ontario to ensure that young people have the opportunity to get the services they need. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, I've committed to bringing forward a plan this year um, that will uh, uh, change uh, 
autism services here in the province of Ontario. And we know that all eyes are on Ontario from across the, pro across the country as we uh, transform the system. We're looking to create 16,000 new spaces, and this will significantly reduce wait times here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, what we aim to do is to put choice and confidence and consistency back into the system to ensure that families have a choice when they uh, are seeking those types Thank of you. services. Supplementary. I think if this mother had a choice, her son would be in the proper facility to get the treatment that he needs. This family has literally been torn apart. She has six other children who had to be moved out of the house so that she can keep those children safe. Remy and his mother live in a space where everything has to be locked for safety. She calls it autism jail. Caring for Remy is around the clock, 24 hours a day. He bites and hurts himself and others. Caring, um, the, si the situation is simply too much for the family to handle. What is the minister going to do to ensure that Remy and his mother get immediate help now to take them out of this crisis that they're in. Thank you. You see that, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've put forward a um, an historical investment into autism services to create 16,000 new spots. And um, the, spe the member opposite asked the question, well, what are we going to do to, uh, to help families here in the province of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I, we've put forward a plan um, to allow parents to choose either direct service, Chair. direct service or they can choose to have direct funding. The question I'd like to ask the NDP, do they agree with the direct funding option that we've put forward? They don't. So here you go. Here we are, and we say, Mr. Speaker, that we're going to go forward with the direct funding. Put the I actually knew the person that was. There might be warnings involved in this. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, we've put a plan forward that will give the family a choice that they can receive that money and actually get the services they need. It's clear that the NDP disagrees with the direct funding option. You know, I think they should let parents know that they disagree with that uh, option, which parents have been asking for for decades in the province of Ontario. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough, Agent Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. We know that there are ongoing issues with fraud in the auto insurance industry. This past weekend, the Global Mail published an investigative report on the bad actors in the system. Fraud costs the system an estimated $1.6 billion annually. This is a serious issue to every people in Ontario. <coughs> In the, is a serious issue in my riding of Scarborough Aging Course, especially the seniors who have to combat high auto insurance rates. As a result, the bad actors driving up the rates. And I have spoken out against the auto insurance fraud issue, Mr. Speaker. Ontario have one of the lowest accident rates of any province, and I know this government has been working tirelessly to address this issue. That's why I'm very pleased, Mr. Speaker, to hear Question. that this government is establishing the Serious Fraud Office. Speaker, to you, to the minister, can he please provide more detail on the Serious Fraud Office and what Thank we will achieve? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you for the question. And the member from Scarborough Agent Court, who's been a true advocate for her constituents regarding auto insurance reform. And I thank my colleagues as well, the Attorney General and the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. This government has taken immediate action to combat criminal fraud with the establishment of the Serious Fraud Office, as the member has just asked. The mandate and scope, first and foremost, is to protect the Ontario public, to limit losses suffered by victims and to recover stolen assets. The Serious Fraud Office would be an integrated, multidisciplinary investigation and prosecution team dedicated to fighting major causes of fraud. This includes serious and complex cases perpetrated from insurance companies, agents, brokers and adjusters, legal service providers, clinics, health practitioners and other health service providers, collision and repair services such as tow trucks, vehicle storage and repair companies. The office Answer. will be up and running in early 2018. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. The member from Brenton West. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. I, too, am pleased to hear of the strong stance our government is taking on fraud in the auto insurance industry. My constituents in Brampton West will be pleased to hear this government remains committed to removing bad actors from the system. It's unfair to those hardworking people in Ontario who are faced with mounting auto insurance rates as a result of a few bad apples taking advantage of the system. And it's not just consumers who, who feel this hit. Victims of auto accidents are also <laughs> the ones who suffer the most. I know that David Marshall found that victims of auto accidents are often caught between insurance companies and the legal system, resulting in delays in receiving care and extended recovery times. That's why this government is ensuring that these individuals are properly taken care of in the event of an accident. Question. Minister, please provide more details on how the government is improving support for victims and consumers. Thank you, Minister. Thank you again for the question and for the member from Brampton West for a strong advocacy and fight on this problem. We are making changes based on the way victims receive treatment for their injuries, putting victims first and helping consumers through sustained reductions in rates. The implementation panel will help us move towards a system that focuses on the implementation of pathways of care and not cash. We're working towards setting up a system that provides immediate treatment for those suffering from minor and common injuries so that they get the appropriate care they need when they need it. And we're also making sure victims are receiving neutral and highly credible assessments through an independent neutral examination centers. And when bad actors take advantage of the system, these costs get passed along to honest drivers. Removing cash incentives will ultimately provide savings to the drivers and lower premiums. Yes, and I thank my colleagues for their strong advocacy and fight against this issue. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oslo. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today is the one-year anniversary of third reading of Bill 9, an act to amend the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care Act. Speaker, Bill 9 received all party support on December 5, 2016, marking a crucial milestone in the provision of rehabilitation services for post-stroke recovery patients 19 to 64 years of age. Yet one year later, Speaker, one year later, these post-stroke Ontario residents still cannot receive the services they need and deserve. Speaker, when will the Liberal government stop the age discrimination of post-stroke survivors 19 to 64 years of age and implement Bill 9? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to say that we are implementing uh, Bill 9, the a private member's bill that was brought forward by the member opposite and enacted into uh, law uh, as a result of uh, uh, his intervention, which I uh, am gratified. Uh, and appreciative of, of his strong advocacy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring that uh, those who require physiotherapy uh, um, support, including those that are uh, facing, uh, who have suffered a stroke, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're committed to improving access to health services that they require that will result in better outcomes. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we um, know that, uh, that uh, that individuals who have suffered a stroke uh, face uh, enormous challenges, and uh, that is why this act, and Answer. we are implementing it uh, to the letter, Mr. Speaker, uh, this act, uh, I believe, will make a difference in their lives. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. For the past 14 years, this Liberal government has failed Ontarians when it's come to the availability of health care. Speaker, post-stroke recovery patients 19 to 64 years of age have waited a full year for the Liberal government to implement Bill 9. Will the Minister of Health take action today and provide post-stroke re rehabilitation services to Ontario residents 19 to 64 years of age? Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I appreciate the fact that this act is now law and we are implementing it as a ministry, uh, but I do need to remind the member that uh, what uh, in their platform was described as a, an historic investment in mental health is anything but that, Mr. Speaker, because it's an investment, it's a commitment over 10 years of $1.9 billion, and in using precisely the same uh, methodology as they have, Mr. Speaker, our increased investment in mental health over the past 10 years 
has been in excess, just from my ministry alone, in excess of $10 billion. So our investments are unprecedented. Our investments are historic. It reflects the commitment that all of us have here in this legislature to mental health. So I ask that member opposite his party to Answer. sign on to our pledge of committing more than $1.9 billion to mental health over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Time for question period is over. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 142, an act to amend the Construction Lean Act. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Please take your seats. On December 4, 2017, Mr. McAfee moved third reading of Bill 142, an act to amend the Construction Lien Act. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McAfee. Mr. McAfee. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Craft. Mr. Craft. Ms. Donnelly. Ms. Donnelly. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jass. Mrs. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Hartman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmaskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadish. Mr. Nadish. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 87, the nays are zero. The ayes being 87, the nays being zero, the return of the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, the next reading of the bill. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure of the motion to second reading of Bill 175. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell. November 15, 2017, Madame Lalonde moves second reading of Bill 175, an act to implement measures with respect to policing, coroners, and forensic laboratories, and to enact, amend, and repeal certain other statutes and revoke uh, a regulation. Mr. Delaney has moved that the question be now put. All those in favor of Mr. Delaney's motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Morini. Mr. Morini. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Domino. Ms. Domino. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jass. Mrs. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renil. Ms. Renil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren.
All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 49, the nays are 39. The ayes being 49, the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Madame Lalonde has moved second reading of Bill 175, an act to implement measures with respect to policing, coroners, and forensic laboratories, and to enact, amend, or repeal certain other statutes and revoke a regulation. Is it the motion is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? No, I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. <laughs> Same vote. I heard a no. Madame Lalonde moves second reading of Bill 175, an act to implement measures with respect to policing, coroners, and forensic laboratories, and to enact, amend, and repeal certain other statutes and revoke a regulation. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Ms. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. 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 Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French.
The ayes are 49, the nays are 39. The ayes being 49, the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture, du projet de loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? The Minister of Community, Safety and Correction Services. I would ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Justice a Policy. So ordered. There are no def point of order. The member from Nepean, Carleton. Speaker, I, um, I wanted to introduce, and I know introductions has long passed, but a, a close friend of mine, Alice McCarran, is here from Nova Scotia. We went to university together, and uh, she went on to work uh, for Premier Ham in Nova Scotia, and I'm delighted that she's here to visit with me today. Welcome. There are no further deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.